Here we have Amanda Cavallari, um, who will be talking about, oh gosh, what are you talking about? I had it written all down. She's talking about all sorts of things. Now, if I remember correctly, um, she'll be talking about um, how to basically make privacy go a little bit more mainstream in society. Um, so let's welcome Amanda. And we just hatched a little plan um, to get Jerry back up here at the last of my five minutes because I think the law is pretty important to understand. So if you could let me know when that is so we can get him up here and have some of my five minutes, that's super important. A little bit more than mainstream, gotta focus on the law first. Um, so I'm Amanda Cavallari. I actually grew up in Colorado, so welcome. Who is visiting? Oh, nice, awesome. Well, thanks for coming if you want food recommendations or hikes or anything, let me know. Um, I'll give you one tip, but you can't share it. I know now the internet's going to see it, but it's my favorite restaurant for lunch. It's called Domo. It's this Japanese restaurant, D-O-M-O. -O, and they have like, the dinner is great as well, but lunch is, is really where it's at. So um, thank you so much for having me. I definitely feel a little underqualified or very underqualified in this room, but I will do my best to try to share some of my experiences and kind of um, hopes for what this space can do in regards to privacy as well and how we might be able to connect to the mainstream a little bit more. Um, so my background, I actually got into this space and I don't have slides. And if you all have questions, just like throw them at me. So this is more of a conversation. Um, so we'll be a little bit rowdy if you're, if you're up for it. Um, so I actually was in healthcare tech for a long time and was seeing, you know, the HIPAA regulations to me don't really protect people's privacy. There's so many security vulnerabilities um, and issues that it's just, it's phenomenal what, what we're doing with people's personal healthcare data. And to me, from an ethical side, especially working with the 50 plus population, you have a lot of chronic, you know, chronic, multiple chronic conditions as well as you get older. And it does prohibit people from getting help um, when, their, when their data or information is out there. So I think you know, anonymity and privacy with healthcare is especially important for people to get the, the care that they need and to ask for help for things. Um, so that's how I got into distributed ledger. Uh -huh. Yeah, we can look at a couple extremes. So let's go with older or even middle age, right? You have early, you're having memory issues. Maybe you have early onset um, Alzheimer's, but you're embarrassed about it because it could hurt your career, all sorts of things. So why would you get help? I mean, I think it's a lot of people, an accident happens or, yeah, or addiction, all sorts of different things will stop people from being open about their health. Um, so that's how I got here. And so I had the opportunity to do some work with Carnegie Mellon University. Um, we were working on some machine learning applications and robotics applications um, around how to enable people to you know, live in their homes longer if that's where they wanna live. And that's where the healthcare or the, the privacy factor came in quite a bit. People were thinking about it but didn't really know how to solve it. So um, last year I had the opportunity to work with basically the godfather of the space, um, David Chom, C-H-A-U-M. So uh, he's the CEO of DigiCash and then um, MixNets, he's the man. So I um, got to learn from him and we got to travel around, around the world with his startup. And so we got to see some global trends and coming at this from a totally non, you know, um, blockchain backgrounds, got to look at look at things in a global perspective. So again, if we're looking at aging by 2030, one billion people in the world will be over the age of 65. So that's a pretty decent chunk. And I think it's, it's a part of the population a lot of us maybe think about as last as being adopters of tech, but they very much value their privacy. So when we're creating these technologies and putting you know, information into computers, so he's like, well, where's this data going? What's happening with this? They're the only population that cons consistently asked what, what's happening with my data. So I think it's very much an overlooked uh, demographic that would be very, very, very great advocates um, for some of the work that we're doing. Um, so that's, that's a little bit on you know, one, one part of the 
population to consider that maybe isn't, you know, at front of mind. Um, the other issues with that that group is there is a lot of financial fraud. So having more data out there and being, ex you know, having access to their information, uh, there's it, reports vary, but it could be three billion to I think 35 or 36 billion per year in financial fraud um, with with older populations. So that's a huge chunk of money and a pretty big um, burden on society when, you know, because they live on a fixed income, then they go to Medicaid, and then so we're paying, in the end we're paying a lot more by not protecting these vulnerable populations. So I think that's another way to think about pri the importance of privacy that maybe, you know, we don't think about every day until it happens to a family member. Um, is there anyone who, is into healthcare tech at all in here? Yeah, we got like two. Okay, so we won't talk about that. But it is interesting, and I think it is a great use case um, for all of us to consider. Uh, so while, you know, while working um, with David and then outside of that as well before, there are some really interesting projects that I think could could be good examples that are very uh, local, very hyper local, and then um, some that are you know global, and one that I found really interesting. Has anyone ever heard of um, Sardex in Sardinia, off of Italy? So they've been around since like 2009, 2010. I think they got their first customer, um, but it's basically an electronic system of mutual credit, um, and they're really interesting because they hedged. They did pretty well when the rest of the economy in Italy was tanking. Sardinia did a little bit better. So as far as looking at like bigger economic um, use cases, they're a really interesting group to look at as, as we build out products for this space. Um, you know, as far as privacy goes, they're not super private, but I think if you're looking hyper-local, that's a really interesting place to look. And then in the US, um, you know, Jerry and I talked a little bit about Wyoming, and we need to check on how the federal laws work with everything. But if you're working on a very local project, Wyoming has a lot of new regulations, and it might be worth with digging into if you do want to stay in the U.S. or base something in, in the U.S. I think they just passed with 13, 13 bills, um, and we'll let Jerry cover that if he has any extra time in his loss. Um, so that's another amazing place to, to think about, like basing a business as well. The first LLC ever was actually formed in Jackson Hole. So I don't, I think a lot of times we think Delaware based companies for LLCs, but really Wyoming's pretty interesting in that regards. Um, as far as uh, those things go, so those are two very local projects that I think have, you know, or places that are worth looking into while you all are traveling um, as well. And then as far as mainstream adoption goes for the younger generation, so Gen Z, universities are really a great place to plug yourself into. Does anyone here do anything with, with universities or students? A few of us. That might be like an action we can each actually take is to get more involved with, with universities um, or coding schools. That's that's huge. And then one other question I have too is how many of us have met with an actual like legislator in the last year? So a few of us, yeah, kind of. I think that's another thing as well. Um, there is a lot of fear in this space, fear of change, fear of new things. And if they can put, you know, have a decent conversation with people about this and we can come from a more educational approach and share some of the publications um, from Coin Center or other aspects, I think that's huge in as far as advocacy and mainstream adoption goes because at the end of the day, uh, law is extremely important, which is why I'll be giving Jerry a few minutes because I think it's something we definitely need to, need to really grasp and be part of. Um, otherwise, we'll get swept and, and left behind. So if privacy is something that we all really do value, I think it's looking at these ways that we personally can take, you know, take steps to get more involved or somehow support behind the scenes. Um, I think that's huge. So does anyone have any questions about that? If not, I think Jerry's time is here.
Okay, um, as a baby boomer with gray hair, I have to comment on your talk and the previous talk. My comment is I see my generation as actually one of the last privacy protecting generation because we were brought up with bearer instruments. Mm -hmm. So my question is how do you see overall bearer instruments and, and how you can reach um, essentially because uh, all the people, what is the, what is the, the selling points that you see for someone from my generation. Yeah, so it's interesting because if we're talking about boomers specifically, so I like specialize in have generational marketing as well, um, but boomers also, you know, it doesn't matter if they're liberal and they were hippies in the 60s or if they served in Vietnam, I think you're absolutely right that privacy is something that a lot of folks in that generation are very passionate about, so they very well may be the last holdout. Um, I would say the greatest generation was especially into privacy, um, so World War II era. So, I mean, it's what's, I guess it's tying what is important to that age group, so probably, you know, I'm not trying to play off of a stereotype, but healthcare is, is something that is important, and privacy in healthcare, I think, is a, a stance that can be taken very easily as far as looking at lobbyists and legislators, like healthcare is a big deal right now um, in DC as well as locally. So if you can find the advocacy groups around that and, and try to work with those groups to teach them about privacy. So going, I mean, ARP is probably just as powerful or more than the NRA in DC. Um, and I actually had a fellowship with them years ago. So going in and talking to your local AARP office and your representative, and so that they can then speak to the representatives about privacy on your behalf, I think that's huge. So it's finding those, those influencers um, and speaking to them about what is important to you. So if it's healthcare, whatever it might be, I think that's probably just a very low hanging fruit and then again, talking about something like the financial fraud, um, privacy can help you know, with, with so much of that as well. But, and those are two hot issues for that specific organization. So that might be a, a good thing to tap into. Did that answer a little? I know, not the bare instruments exactly, but I think is. Mm -hmm. The greatest generation. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's like, I don't know. I, I convinced my grandmother to get on Facebook five years ago and have regretted it ever since because she was right, right? So she's off. <laughs> um, but it's that, you know, our younger generations are sometimes more into what's convenient. So building products that are convenient. Like right now, I can't expect my grandmother to be the custodian of her own wallet or her own digital assets. So we have to create this technology so that it's absolutely seamless in their day-to-day -day lives as well. So most of it is, a lot of it is going to be user experience. So maybe it's bringing more user experience folks in here and more product people in here um, to help us build actually usable, like fun, friendly products is, is really important too. So it's a day-to-day, -day, a day-to-day -day thing. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. So uh, I'm not sure if this falls within your domain of expertise, but uh, to what degree do you think the uh, contributions that blockchain-related technology can have to um, like uh, medical records and you know, medical transactions, uh, to what degree do you think that those contributions are going to be related to a decentralized system or a system that is more like a um, consortium that is sort of uh, entered into by a bunch of private companies that agree to share their data in specific protocols or formats? Like, does it need to be decentralized? Should it be decentralized? I think it should for security breach reasons. So if the data is all stored on the same servers, that obviously makes it more vulnerable. So I like that. that Factor, but it doesn't mean that there can't be a consortium where there's a smart contract and you're a patient and you agree to share this part of your healthcare record in exchange for, you know, a discount on your premium. Like I think there's an economic way to to make it 
it work for the for the users and for companies. But right now, what we're seeing, like with, uh, I was at South by Southwest of, uh, a couple months back and talking to a lot of data scientists. And even a lot of data scientists are coming to this, like, come to Jesus realization that what they're doing with data, one, it's, it's you know, secondary and tertiary markets. Like, that data is not even useful because, yeah, they have a mailing list of 10 million people, but no one's answering back. But some, for some reason, these corporations still pay for them to sell, send things out on their mailing list. So I think it, if, it's, if there's buy-in from the users or the patients for healthcare specifically, um, and they understand, you know, that, you know, what the value, if they receive value in sharing that information and it's up to them and that makes sense for them on a fixed income, that's all, that's up to them. But right now it's not up to people. I mean, you look at um, what's going on with data and healthcare and you see right now it's, you know, it's still the hot topic. So where we're, uh, where we're kind of obsessing about privacy and social media, we're not, Thinking about it in healthcare yet on a big, in the mainstream. Um, what do you, what are your thoughts on releasing data as part of like an emergency process, from like an ER standpoint? If I'm in control of my data, and I'm unconscious to, to make that digital signature or whatever it needs to be and I can't release it to the hospital. Just kind of general thoughts in, in that area, I guess. Yeah, I, so you look at um, other things as well. You have, like on your driver's license, you know, organ donor or not. I think it has to be kind of built into how we're identified with the government. So what, at what level are we okay with with our information and maybe some people don't want, if they go to the ER, they don't want anything released and that's up to them. That's what I believe, but that's my personal belief. Um, like the kind of the advanced sign off that in an emergency, you can use my data. Yeah, so maybe the driver's license can, or your identify, however we're identified, can have some sort of smart contract on it that says if this, then that, if this, then that. So it's like putting a living will almost having a living will with you at all times. I think that's that's huge. Um, choice is so important. And then you look at, um, I spent some time in Puerto Rico because it is an aging popula population after after the hurricanes hit. Um, and there's so, they didn't even know how many people died, right? So I think that's a, that is really, we do really need to figure figure that out. We're too advanced to not have that on lockdown. Hello. Yeah. Um, once you release the data to um, some company, uh, how do you stop them from uh, using it somewhere else or sending it to someone else? That has to, yeah. I mean, that's up to the company, I think, and you knowing what you're signing up for. And if they breach that agreement, how can you um, pursue legal action? I think that's, I think we'll see more like class action lawsuits out of data privacy breaches, and maybe that will help some of these companies start to to not do things like that. And then with GDPR um, becoming stronger out of Europe um, and more attention being placed on on privacy and data, you know, theoretically that should get better. But I think, unfortunately, it's probably going to be um, consumers being very mindful and, and keeping track of everything. So it's a lot of noise, it's very overwhelming. So that's why if we can make our products, you know, very usable and, and you know, build privacy in on a subconscious level, I think that's really what we need to do is make it as passive as possible. Um, so while I love the beautiful wallets and, and everything, I think, you know, most, maybe most of us in this room are capable of, of using that type of technology, I know my, my grandparents can't, and they're the ones that are probably the most vulnerable with privacy as well. Okay, Jerry, it's time for your law lecture. Thank you, I appreciate it.
Look, I think maybe the better thing to do would be to take any questions uh, you all might have. Um, what I'll say is this, is that what um, our approach has been is this. Is when we've been talking to policymakers, say a member of Congress or staffers, um, usually the privacy question comes up and they'll say something like, but isn't this stuff anonymous? You know, isn't something that criminals can, can use to hide what they're doing? And what we've always been able to say to, to that for the last five, six, seven years is, no, actually it's not anonymous at all. The blockchain is completely transparent. All transactions are public. And um, you know, law enforcement actually can see what's happening. And here are our friends at Chain Analysis, and they can show you how they do this. And here's our friend Katie Hahn, and she can show you how she's prosecuted people with evidence from the blockchain. Um, and they're like, okay, they're, so they're satisfied with that. And that's, that's a very good story that we've been able to tell. Um, but over the last year, 18 months, um, we now, when we tell the story, somebody says, but what about Monero? <laughs> or what about Zcash? And we're like, that's a good question. Um, and we can talk about that. And so what we've been developing here, we, we've always known that we would get to the day when we would have to explicitly address that. And that's what we're doing here with our series of papers. So our approach is, a one-two punch. One is making the moral case for cash. Where we say, hey, this stuff is no different than cash. Cash that you and I have, Mr. Congressman, in our pockets right now. That's completely anonymous, right? But there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it underpins an open society that you, you know, uh, officer, um, uh, director, um, care about, which is why you do what you do, right? So we, we, we make that moral case. And then the second thing that we do which is what the second paper that Peter Van Valkenburg uh, wrote for us, um, what it does is, is that it says, um, and by the way, here are the constitutional limits um, to uh, what regulation aimed at electronic cash can, are. Um, and so what I'll say is this, is that the way we approach it, we think that electronic cash should be treated no differently than cash. And so what does that mean? It means um, that um, you're free to hold it and use it. Um, and if it's yours, you can do whatever you want with it, right? Um, as long as you're doing it within the law, right? You can't obviously do something that's against the law, but not because you're using cash, but because the thing that you're doing is against the law. Um, we've got something called the Bank Secrecy Act. Uh, the Bank Secrecy Act um, is the law that uh, requires intermediaries to do KYC, to know their customers, uh, to register with FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network at Treasury, to um, file suspicious activity reports, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that law really has something to do with cash or individuals' ability to use with cash. That's not regulated. Um, it does require that intermediaries um, report, there's something called cash transaction reports. So if you go to your bank and you, um, you wanna withdraw $20,000 in cash, you can do that, it's your money. You can just go in there and ask for it and they will give you $20,000 in cash. But they are obligated to report to FinCEN that you've um, withdrawn uh, that money. Um, as long as there's that parity, um, we think that you can apply, that's, so you know, to the extent that regulators, policymakers are looking for a regime to deal with electronic cash, we're saying just treat it no differently than cash. But once you've got the cash, you know, there's no reporting, there's no surveillance there. Um, so then the question you might be asking yourself is, wait a minute, you've got the Bank Secrecy Act. The Bank Secrecy Act basically is a warrantless um, mass surveillance scheme where intermediaries, all the banks in the, in the country, are deputized to report on their customers. How is that constitutional? And the answer is, um, there's something called the third party doctrine that was developed by the Supreme Court. And basically it says this, it says, um, when you as an individual voluntarily give information that otherwise would be private, you give information voluntarily to a third party, your bank let's say, and your bank has, and that third party, the bank has a legitimate business purpose for having it, um, then you no longer have an expectation of privacy. And so Fourth Amendment um, protections against warrantless search don't exist. What we would say is two things, and I've got 38 seconds. I swear I'll take questions later if anybody, any of you want to ask me. Um, what we say is this, is 
when you use electronic cash systems without intermediaries, right, when you're using it peer to peer, number one, you're not volunteering any information about yourself. And the validators who are validating transactions don't have any legitimate business pur purpose for knowing any, any of your personal data. So for example, if you write a check and you give it to your bank, or you, the person you're your payee gives it to the bank to cash it, the check, necessarily, the bank has to know your name so they can know who to withdraw it from. They have to know the name of the person that you're paying so they can deposit it in their account. And they have to know the amount so they know how much. And you're giving that data voluntarily. In an electronic cash systems, especially privacy preserving electronic cash systems, you're not giving up any voluntary data and the system does not have any legitimate purpose for requiring that data. So what we say is, is that any requirements that would basically impose BSA type um, uh, regulations on the network itself or on developers is unconstitutional under the Fourth Amendment. And the way you would typically go about requiring that is that you would go to developers and say, you've got to write this in. You've got to write in this back door, essentially. And what we would say there is that that is compelled speech, which would be a violation of the First Amendment. Um, so I'll stop there and ask me any questions later.